This is the support film for Booklet 4 of the GCSE Plimstock History course for Germany 1919-1945. Booklet 4 is on the Nazi dictatorship and together with Booklets 5 and 6 will be examined in the end of Unit Test 3 on life in Hitler's Germany. To put this booklet into its context, the first booklet, Weimar Germany, looked at the conditions and the context of Germany after World War I in which the Germans turned away from democracy towards the Nazis after the Wall Street crash of 1929. Booklet 2 studies the Nazis and their rise to power against the backdrop of Booklet 1. So Booklets 1 and 2 are two parallel timelines. Booklet 3 looks at the 18 months between January 1933 and August 1934, when Hitler goes from being a democratically elected chancellor to the undisputed dictator of Germany 18 months later. Booklets 4, 5 and 6 all share the common theme of his attempt to establish a totalitarian state. A dictatorship where, to quote Hugh Trevor Roper, a society from which even the imagination had no means of escape. Booklet 7 and Booklet 8 also tie in with this theme of totalitarianism. This booklet will show how Hitler set out to solve all the problems he saw with Weimar Germany. It will show how Hitler established a system of government where he had total control over everyone and everything. Individualism and opinions were not tolerated in Hitler's totalitarian Germany. Only the will of Hitler. This will be achieved, as this booklet will show, through the role of Hitler himself as a dictator, how he deals with his enemies through the role of the police, and finally his control over the media and censorship by our studying propaganda. So again, there are three ways in which this booklet will look at his attempt to establish a totalitarian state himself as the dictator, the role of the police in creating a police state, and the role of propaganda. By the end of this booklet, students should be able to attempt the following GCSE questions. How was the police state used to control Germany? How successful was Hitler in establishing a totalitarian dictatorship? And obviously by that question, not just his successes, but to balance the answer where he fell short of achieving total control. How did Hitler and the Nazis use propaganda to control Germany? Why was propaganda used by the Nazis? And how did Hitler achieve total control in Germany? Now, as with all the booklets in this course, everything that we teach in lesson is available on the school shared area. A support page is written on the internet, which can be accessed through the website www.historynetwork.co.uk. We have additional iPod resources in school, audio files with much more developed information for students aiming for A star, A and B grades. This booklet is supported by a DVD which the students can either download or purchase from the department and we have wider reading as well to support the students. This booklet, like all the others, will form a core body of knowledge, the key information and testing of skills that students will need to be familiar with. We make no assumptions that it's written in a format that is preferred by the students. Students will be taught and have been taught to be informed about their preferred styles of learning and their revision notes will need to take a different format if the format of this booklet is not appropriate to them. Okay, so the first task students are confronted with in this booklet is to speculate how they would go about establishing a totalitarian state themselves. If that wanted to be achieved, in 21st century Britain, what would you need to control? What different aspects of life would need to be controlled by a government if they wish to establish total control over the people? Now then, to further explore how Germany was run in the 1930s under the Nazis, in the next activity we compare Germany in the 1930s to modern day Britain. Now, we talked about the three themes that we look at this booklet in terms of Hitler's attempt to establish a totalitarian state. The role of the leader themselves, the role of the police, 
and the role of communication, control over the media, propaganda. Students are to study and think about the nature of these roles in both of the states using the prompt statements that are listed underneath. Cutting and pasting or copying into these booklets to be able to compare the two different societies separated by about 80 years of history. When that's done, what we require students to do is to contemplate some of the similarities and differences between the two countries. Students have already studied in year nine the difference between a democracy and a dictatorship, and they have done an overview activity where they're asked to contemplate just how democratic Britain is, just how much of a dictatorship are certain other countries. So I'd like the students to consider how similar is Britain with Nazi Germany, choose the appropriate box and explain their answer. The explanation is the analysis, the higher order thinking, not just the remembering of information, but applying it to the question, does the UK have anything in common with Nazi Germany? OK, now we're going to move on to the role of Hitler as the dictator. At its most simplistic level, history textbooks and our perception of the Nazis would suggest that Hitler was a totalitarian dictator a man of absolute authority in his country. In this section, we're going to explore and quantify the limits and the depth of his power. Now to explore this, we've got a propaganda poster here. And what I would like students to do is to interrogate, to describe, interpret, evaluate this poster in two ways. The most basic way, by labeling what they see in one color and what they can infer about Germany what they can assume about the role of Hitler in Germany from the image. So, for example, straightforward comprehension, Germany was led by Hitler. He is leading from the front. You might want to infer that Hitler might have been regarded as having some kind of messiah, godlike role, because he's bathed in light from the heavens. You might also speculate and link this picture back to a concept that the students have been taught about Germany being a living nation, a living community, in which Hitler represents the eyes and the brain, but the people behind him only serve to support him. He is the only true individual in Germany. Students will have already studied, or will be studying, the idea that certain people had certain roles. Men were the fists and the feet. Women were the reproductive organs of the living German community. So this picture can be interrogated at many different levels, not just what students can see. When students comprehend, they would always be encouraged to infer as well. What do they think? Then students are to read um, source 2 on page 78, uh, which is a description of Hitler and his leadership style in Germany. Now, they will also have watched a programme from uh, the Nazis A Warning from History, entitled Chaos and Consent, which will get them to consider just how much of a dictator Adolf Hitler was. There are arguments that he was a strong leader, and there are arguments that he was a weak leader. It's not as straightforward as one might originally appear to think. And again, down here, students required to think, was he a strong leader? OK, moving on. Who were the enemies of the state in Nazi Germany? Who were the people that Hitler singled out as the threat and the challenge to his authority? Now, what we have here is a list of the inmates uh, from Buchenwald, one of the earliest concentration camps. Now, these camps were established after the Reichstag fire in February 1933 under the emergency powers that Hitler gained, having cited the Reichstag fire as the start of a possible communist revolution. Now, in this activity, students are to read the contents, the groups that were in the camp, and they are to speculate, they are to guess why Hitler regarded them as a threat. Now, the Jews didn't fit. The Jews, according to Hitler, 
are a subhuman group who undermine and dilute the purity of German blood, making them weaker. In Mein Kampf, he even goes as far as to say that the Jews are the reason why Germany lost the war. They don't fit in, therefore they are persecuted. Right from the start, Jews found themselves in the concentration camps. Politicals, well, they would express their own opinions, contrary to Hitler's. Some would have been Democrats. Some would have been more inclined to be left-wing, like the communists. They'd all find themselves in prison if they weren't prepared to compromise their own political opinions. The work shy didn't contribute to the living German nation. Everyone was expected to participate and to join in. The work shy did not. Off to the camps they went to be re-educated. Religious objectors. In a totalitarian state, Hitler cannot even share his authority with a god. Now, when we look at religion later on, we will deal with this concept that no man can have two masters. If your religious views clashed with the views of the Nazis, it was the Nazis who expected to be followed, not God. So religious objectors who objected on grounds of conscience would find themselves in concentration camps. Jehovah's Witnesses in particular, because of their pacifist views refusing to fight, were very much at odds with the Nazi uh, view of war being the glorious thing. Homosexuals would find themselves in the concentration camps because back in the 1930s, homosexuality was illegal in Germany, as it was in many countries, including Britain. It was a crime and the general belief was that homosexuality was a, a choice of sexual identity, not something that is hardwired into people's brains. Therefore, it was not tolerated and punished. And finally, professional criminals, rather like the work shy, choosing to disobey, choosing not to work with the national community. Professional criminals were put into prison and re-educated. Okay. The role of propaganda. Straightforward students to match up the left-hand column with the definitions on the right. Then there's an activity on propaganda and censorship that students will undertake. Then our starter activity, which is the odd one out. An activity where students need to delete the word, the phrase, the sentence they are not happy with, and explain their reasons. Okay. So why did the Nazis want to control the media? Now, the media in the 1930s is not the media of the present day. The, radio, uh, the media of the 1930s consists of the radio, the newspapers, film, festivals, and culture. Students in this activity are to consider why each of these aspects of the media posed a potential threat, and what did Goebbels do to control them? Straightforward. The radio was popular. It was the iPad, the iPod, the smartphone of its age. Everyone wanted one. Everyone walked around with them. Everyone had one at home. Very, very popular. Old radios were often very powerful. So the radios that many Germans had would have been more than capable of picking up foreign broadcasts. A real, real problem for the Nazis if they wanted to control what people heard. A radio that could pick up Britain would be listening to democracy and freedom of speech, which no doubt would clash with the views of the Nazis. What did Goebbels do? He regulated the content of the radio. He insisted that Nazi propaganda be mixed with entertainment. He offered all Germans to hand in their old radios for brand new, attractively designed new ones, which interestingly enough didn't have the power to pick up foreign broadcasts. He also made the editors of radio programmes, as he would with newspapers, liable for the content of their own broadcasts or their articles in their papers. The editor's law. To publish something that the Nazis didn't approve of contravened the editor's law and was considered treason. 
newspapers, as in Britain, are political bias papers which express opinions. If they're contrary to the Nazis, they're therefore a problem. Again, like radio, hugely, hugely popular, very well read. What did, the, what did Goebbels do? He establishes his own Nazi newspaper, applies the editor's law, and sets out general guidelines, but menacing guidelines, to allow editors and newspapers to have some degree of freedom over what they publish, but backed up by the threat that there would be severe implications if the new papers published anything the Nazis did not approve of. Film was a problem, very, very popular. Most films shown in Europe, shown in Germany, came from the United States. Therefore, they were going to express values and opinions that might be contrary to what the Nazis believed in. What Goebbels did, well, he was a huge fan of the cinema. He built Nazi studios to produce films. He insisted that the films be broken in the middle and propaganda be played to the audience. He made very popular, very expensive entertainment films that, not, that Germans went to to be entertained and then would break up the films with propaganda. Festivals could be a problem. Many of them were religiously orientated. Therefore, re-emphasizing the role of religion, which could prove a problem for the Nazis, as we know when they do things that, according to most people's morality, are absolutely outrageous. Therefore, what Goebbels did is he Nazified the festivals. Now, a good example of this would be uh, Mother's Day, a festival in Germany, as it is in most of Europe. Hitler, um, Nazis moved Mother's Day from its traditional date to Hitler's mother's birthday. So instead of it being Mutter's Tag in Germany, it became De Führer's Mutter Tag in Germany, cleverly Nazifying a festival. Culture, the arts, literature, painting, sculpture, poetry, they're all about opinion and therefore they are a threat. Students will have already studied that in the Nazi education curriculum, opinion and subjective subjects and creative subjects are removed from the curriculum. Culture is a very, very powerful tool if people want to protest. What the Nazis do is that they organise culture and make sure that everyone involved in the culture and the arts have to belong to a Nazi union. The Nazi union sets out very strict guidelines as to what is approved and what is not approved. There are threats behind this, people toe the line. From all the propaganda that students have studied, I want them now to distinguish between the propaganda that generates love for Hitler and the propaganda that works the other way to establish Hitler's enemies. When they've gone through their evidence, they draw their own conclusion as to the role of propaganda. A class vote can then be taken. The police state. The students are going to watch a film about how people react to the Gestapo, Hitler's secret police. Watch it, write down the reaction. Now, this is going to be, a lot of it is going to be based upon comedy clips. But nonetheless, the reactions can still be read for students to speculate how, therefore, their reaction to the Gestapo and the SS Hitler's police state would enable Hitler to control the ordinary people. Now then, Hitler created the police state to control the people of Germany. Hitler was placed in charge of the police state. The job of the students now is to find out what se each section of the police state did and how it helped Hitler control the people and establish his totalitarian state. Students will need to understand the role of the SS, the role of the Gestapo, the role of the concentration camps, the role of the courts and police, and the role of informers. Now, the role of the informers and the Gestapo link back again to the programme that students will have watched on Chaos and Consent. 
about the role of um, the police in Nazi Germany. And what it would appear is that the Gestapo, where we have the modern perception of it being um, a, a police force with people on the end of every street corner, it would transpire from the evidence that this wasn't the case. Uh, the city of Würzburg is used as an example. Big, big city, very few policemen. The power of the Gestapo principally comes from the willingness of so many people in Germany to act as informers. It goes on to say that Germany was a country headed by one Hitler, but populated by countless millions of mini-informers. Now we'll study this role even more closely when we look at how children were even encouraged in the Hitler Youth to inform on their parents and grandparents. So how did the SS, the Gestapo, evolve? We know in 1925 that the Gestapo and the SS are simply nothing more than Hitler's private personal bodyguard. They're not even independent, they are part of the SA. Yet in 1934, under Himmler, the SS are responsible for the murder of Ernst Röhm and the leaders of the SA. In doing so, they kill their boss, but they gain their freedom and the absolute trust of Adolf Hitler. Throughout the 1930s, the SS evolve even further, changing from being just a bodyguard and a police force for the Nazi party to take on the role of a national police force, and following the war, an international role. The SS have army units fighting on the Western Front and Eastern Front, during World War II, and from 1940 to 1945, they expand to the extent that they are regarded as a state within a state, a country within a country, with factories and hospitals, business enterprises. They hold Hitler's absolute trust, and obviously during the 1940s, it is to the SS that he entrusts his most secret project, the Endeschlum, the final solution of the Jewish question. The death camps, Auschwitz and Sobibor are all manned by the SS. Students are then determining which was the most important year in the SS's history. Their own opinion, their own choice. 